Welcome to the Business of School podcast brought to you by Cold Connect. Get ready for a journey of topical insights, engaging conversations, and maybe a few aha moments from the business, finance, and technology side of schools. Cold School experts are your host, and with our guests from the world of education, we're about to embark on a learning adventure to support you in the business of your school. Keeping up to date on law changes is important for any organisation. To help us both understand recent updates to legislation and apply these practically to the business of school, we have with us today our guest, James Neat. James has wide experience working with schools and educational institutions. His experience includes providing advice in relation to fee collection, as well as providing advice on enrolment documentation, terms and processes. Welcome James to the Business of School podcast. Thank you, kid, and great to be here. Thanks for joining us. So my first question is going to be, do schools really need lawyers? Well, uh, the answer must be yes. Um, we all know that we live in a very complex world and schools are, of course, complex organisations uh, and they have a range of legal responsibilities and issues that they address. One of the things that I've seen over the years is that sometimes schools have this sense that they're a, a vacuum, they're a closed loop environment where uh, everything happens within the school uh, uh, system, uh, the hierarchy, uh, all of the stakeholders are in a, effectively a closed loop. Sometimes that blinds organisations to the need to recognise that they are in fact a legal entity, often property owning, employing people, dealing with lots of people, lots of risk management issues, uh, lots of legislation that applies to them. Some of it specialist to schools. Yeah much of it very general, which would apply to any business of those sizes. So do they need lawyers? And <laughs> Do laws apply to schools? Certainly they yeah. do. Just like any other company, they're, they're not removed from it? Not at all, not at all. Sometimes they feel that if they are within uh, a closed loop, uh, part of a broader uh, organisation, uh, maybe um, uh, an independent school uh, or uh, a school that's part of a, a church network, yeah. that they are the rules that apply to them, that those things are what guides and informs the decisions they make. But like every business, as you say, uh, the law is going to apply to them equally. And there's lots of aspects to that for them, both from a commercial point of view, from the employment with people, from the finance side of things, their, their development that they're doing with their buildings. Certainly, and when you look at a business, um, uh, any business, uh, you need to understand that it's going to have legal relations with a number of different parties, external contractors, internal stakeholders, there's the duty of care issues, insurance issues, building management, uh, contracts, supply contracts, building contracts for development. You know, in some ways you could say that a school that's undertaking a redevelopment um, a, or a building a new wing is in fact a, a property developer. Mm. It's going to have all of the same issues that a property developer down the road on a corner block doing another building will face. Yeah. Same set of issues exactly. And like one of your areas of speciality is schools. So how are schools using lawyers in the current environment? Uh, in, in short, I'd say not often enough. Um, as a lawyer, um, uh, there's nothing more frustrating uh, and makes our task slightly more difficult if the client or a school comes to us too late in the process. Yeah. Um, uh, proactive engagement with lawyers to take a sounding on an issue. Yeah. To, Almost to, part of the strategic decision making. Well, certainly. I mean, there's there's all, all manner of different issues. Sometimes there are crisis issues which arise yeah. and, and yeah. you can't predict that they're going to happen and you have to immediately react and respond. But you know, there's a whole range of other things that can be done on a more of a project management basis where people know that things need to be addressed, internal policies or uh, enrolment terms and conditions, um, uh, staff contracts to the degree that those things apply. Broader things like uh, privacy uh, policies. Uh, and protocols. All those types of issues can be conducted in a more orderly way. What happens unfortunately is it's often a crisis moment where someone puts something mm. to them. Um, uh, 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 stress cases like family breakdown uh, where there'll be a dispute uh, between uh, uh, parents and uh, different guardians of children uh, that often throw up issues that are quite urgent at the time which really could have been addressed in advance if there'd been some more considered thought go into the processes, the procedures, mm. Mm. the clarity of paperwork and policy, the consistency of paperwork and policies. So often we see 
something that was put up on the web as a link five years ago, which is different to the materials that were in the newsletter last yeah. week, which is inconsistent with the enrolment form, which didn't in fact marry with the terms and conditions yeah. when the offer of in, um, enrolment was granted. And we're not even looked at the fee policy. Yeah? At, at all those types of issues, you yeah. know, those, those those are things that um, uh, uh, at so often they don't cause any dramas and because they're not constantly causing dramas, people think all is well, leave it alone. They're not on the radar to review. Perfectly said. Um, but in truth, when the when, when it becomes an issue, it's often too late to say, yeah. well, let's look at the paperwork, let's point to something. We have an answer to it already existing in our okay. in our standardised paperwork. And in the, in the current environment, what are you finding being one of the most common crisis moments that schools are facing where they're reaching out to lawyers? Um, uh, certainly the whole range of issues related to, to fees, yeah. um, uh, especially given uh, cost of living issues and the, the, the great transition from public education to private uh, education uh, is continuing, but it is throwing up a lot of fee-related uh, issues. Yeah. People who are sometimes, sadly, it's obvious, uh, setting things up to milk the system to get mm. a couple of years mm. of, of free education um, and then to, to wheedle their way yeah. out. Um, uh, so there's those types of issues. But there's also a broader legislative framework that is always changing, always evolving. Uh, things like privacy we've talked about. More recently, uh, across the commercial world, and this applies to schools, unfair contracts uh, and whether standard terms and conditions need to be mm. negotiated. Contracts or. with what particularly? Uh, uh, the, 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 the legislation basically seeks to uh, uh, give a consumer balance, as it were, to small businesses and individuals who are given pro forma uh, contracts to sign. Um, uh, the principle is that if you can't negotiate it, um, or if it includes terms which are unreasonable, uh, then there might be a remedy available uh, to that person at a later stage okay. under the unfair contracts. Have Act. you got a specific example or case to you for um, well, to a school? There was, there was a case in uh, the ACT uh, courts um, uh, relatively recently uh, which addressed this issue. Um, uh, family split, uh, one party um, not on the enrolment form, uh, refused to pay uh, fees um, and the this legislation was thrown up as a defence. Uh, it, it wasn't something that the parents or the guardians engineered from the outset, but it became known to them that this legislation may apply and there may be a remedy for them. So mm. they, they, they reached for it and relied upon it. In a perfect world, the response would be, these are standard terms and conditions, uh, our T's and C's are consistent, all of the paperwork marries together neatly. It's been very clear, it's been transparent, we've given it to you, you've had an opportunity to read it, it's very accessible, it's available through our website, etc. Um, uh, but when you get to a stage where uh, those things don't marry, uh, you're asking for problems because mm. you're effectively mm. giving free kicks to the other side mm. to say, well, these papers don't work, I wasn't given the opportunity to negotiate that, that's unfair in the circumstances. Okay. And is there, are there any simple things that you can recommend that schools do to try and mitigate some of these crisis risks? Um, I uh, mean, that's got, in a general sense, obviously there's some very particular crises there that schools will come across. But yeah, certainly. As, as we agree, there'll, there'll always be a case in point on the day that, yeah. need, that needs help where uh, the principal calls, uh, you're summoned to the principal's office and there's a particular issue that someone's raised or that, that you're dealing with. There's always going to be those issues. That's, that's part of being in the school's environment, unfortunately. But broader term, I think it's about having the key management within the school, um, uh, the stakeholder management group, recognise that there is a statutory compliance obligation, that the school has to make sure mm. that they've ticked all the boxes and get it onto an agenda and just have it gently work its way through mm. a project model. Yep. Well, I, I find one of our frustrations is that the school cycle of terms and different management structures, uh, different sign-off authorities within the school these are all issues which impact the progress of those projects. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if, if they could be progressed in a more orderly way, uh, we would iron the wrinkles, as it were, mm. and mm. avoid problems for later. Well, it's interesting you say in that best practice process, you, you, you mm. mentioned compliance, and it's, it's a, the awareness of the need for that compliance is right at the very beginning of the process, isn't it? Um, is there any particular ways that you can... Uh, recommend that schools try and get their education on the compliance required in the business of schools? Uh, 
There needs to be a champion for the issue yeah, okay. uh, within the organisation, and that's probably not going to be the principal. No, often falls uh, on the shoulders uh, of the business manager. It falls, to, it falls into the who's going to own this issue yeah. or this project or this loose end or this topic, and mm. invariably uh, business managers um, uh, and bursars and people in the finance team end up with these uh, loose ends. That doesn't mean they're empowered to drive those issues mm. as change. Um, if I could wave a magic wand, it would be that whatever the management structure may be, board or uh, hierarchical or whatever it might be, would recognise the need for this as, as an agenda item mm. to progress through. Because once you've gone through and done a effectively a legal audit of all of your statutory obligations, the framework of the paperwork that you might mm. need to be compliant, it's done. Yeah. Well, we're finding as well is that the, um, most of the schools that are... are are active in mitigating that risk have actually set up risk and compliance committees where it, this is a very um, def, definite group that are focusing on these areas that there's a there's an ongoing periodic um, framework of review yeah. um, and and that makes it very effective in in re reducing the numbers of times where there's a an immediate crisis where they've actually thought about it and they're ahead of it and they've got things in place and tools ready and they've involved the right professionals as well, yeah. which is your first point. Yeah, certainly. The project is, as a task, the, the, the work is in that first phase to go through everything mm. once for the first time. But once you get to that point, maintenance of that on an annual basis through something like a mm. risk management committee becomes a much more orderly and procedural um, uh, process. Uh, without the need to reinvent the wheel every time. Too often I think we're doing piecemeal parts of the project yeah. and we'll get one part right and they go, well, that's great, we've ticked those boxes, thanks, move on. Now I, I need to go away and hire more staff or get on with the project for the redevelopment of something at the school uh, and the rest of the issues get lowered down the priority list, unfortunately. Um Often we say nothing ever stands still, things are always changing. Is the legal environment static for schools at the moment? No, not at all, not at all. A um, uh, range of issues. Uh, like all um, um, businesses in the consumer space, uh, there's greater regulation, there always is. There's more empowerment of rights yeah. to the individuals. Um, uh, that's very much the case in terms of all private rights, uh, privacy, unfair contracts act we've talked about. Um, uh, there's always going to be legislative change in that space that people need to look for and monitor. There are special obligations, of course, being in school, mandatory notification, child risk yeah. assessment issues. There's a whole range of those types of things which are never static. Uh, and I also think that uh, individuals are f uh, uh, feel more empowered to stand their ground, to take a legal position. It used to be that it was, oh, well, uh, this is a, you know, mm. a big organisation. I've signed on, I know what I was in for, uh, uh, you know, whatever the issue might be, but uh, I, I know where I stand. These days, it's no bugger that, excuse the French, uh, no, I'll take them on, yeah. uh, I have some remedies, I can make some noise, uh, I, can, I can hit the social media and get this as a hot topic and get it going. Now that's, that's when we move to crisis management. And um, we've spoken a little bit today about the, the need for the lawyer's interaction with schools and the leadership there. Um, can you expand on that a little bit and how is the best way that schools can conduct themselves to make the most of the services that are available to them? Yeah, lawyers always need one point of contact um, where they've got certainty that the, they're dealing with someone who has the right authority uh, to be speaking to them and that there's going to be certainty in the instructions which are provided, clarity in the instructions, certainty and consistency in those instructions. Uh, sometimes um, uh, we're engaged by people who have been uh, uh, asked to make a call, to take a sounding, but then it really becomes a question of, I need to take that back on board, I need to go back to the principal, I need to go back to the board, I need to engage with all of the stakeholder groups, etc. Mm. Now that's well and good and they are the real dynamics of life in school, uh, decision making, to be blunt, uh, staff room politics on some occasions. But they don't necessarily help um, make the lawyer engagement process clearer, cleaner, simpler. Um, uh, it helps the lawyer if we know that we've got uh, the ability to deal with one person who has proper authority 
uh, uh, that the instructions are comprehensive. Uh, the more you can give us by way of a background brief in advance, the easier it will be for us to come to a landing because we'll have that broader context in terms of those instructions. There'll always be more detail that we'll need to flesh out finite things, but um, if you can give us a bigger picture um, and some context at, in a clearer way at the earliest opportunity, that will guide us and, of course, that ultimately means the saving for the school in terms mm. of the fees. Mm. Another issue I would um, touch upon as a consequence of that is when we give that advice, um, if it is in response to a, a crisis moment or a particular issue that's been raised that the school's addressing, uh, a, a hot political potato, a noisy, um, discordant parent, a family breakup issue, um, uh, whatever it might be, that advice will be about that and hopefully will answer that query. But beyond that will be broader learnings mm. because um, uh, uh, you'll always have the, the opportunity to say, right, um, that's what happened in that occasion. What um, have we learned from that? What does that say about our paperwork? What does it say about our internal training or protocols mm. or clarity of sign-off authorities within the organisation? All of those takeaway lessons should be gleaned to get the best value uh, from the uh, from the legal outcome. Yeah. So it's we'll answer your question, but also beyond that, what broader learnings uh, can you apply across the organisation? Okay, all right. Well, an another thing that's sort of related to that that we commonly see, especially with schools, uh, small schools, is that um, the school will engage with the same lawyer for every situation they're having to deal with, or it might be someone they've used for a long time or someone that is in the school community. Can you just maybe talk a little bit about the importance of using the right lawyer with the right experience and skill set for the right situation? Look, um, uh, uh, the easiest analogy is uh, doctors. You go to a GP for most things. You can have a regular GP who knows you, who knows your history, knows how you operate, knows yes. how your body works. Yeah. And they have a very important role to play. And they do, uh, they do. But there will be occasions where a specialist is, is required and they should refer you. So uh, in small schools, yes, uh, sometimes there will be a, a parent, maybe someone on the board uh, or a local lawyer who um, uh, knows enough about this space uh, to be able to be uh, able to help the school on most occasions. But it's about knowing where um, uh, you cross that line into a specialist set of um, mm. skills. Um, uh, the, there are a range of different things that we do within our firm. The employment law, I have an I have two partners in the employment section who yeah. uh, work in that area uh, and I, I don't tread on their patch because they're specialists in that space. There's a whole range of things that they would leave to me. The construction team, for example, yes. who work with yeah. schools on major project developments or building issues, defects, architectural, engineering claims, whatever it might be, um, uh, you, you pick the horse for the course. Um, someone who knows the school system uh, is adept to dealing with the reporting requirements of schools because they're different. Uh, to a private uh, client in many ways. Um, uh, but you do need to pick the, the expert, the horse yeah. for the course when needed. Excellent. Well, thanks very much, James, for being with us today. It's always a pleasure having you on the Business of School podcast and we look forward to having you on again soon for another Practical Law for Schools update. Great. Thanks, Thank Kenneth. It's great to share and download uh, some of the uh, experience for yeah. people's benefits. Great to do Thank this. You. Thank you. And that's a wrap for this episode of the Business of School podcast. We've enjoyed the conversation today and would love to have you join us for future episodes. Please hit the subscribe button and follow the links below to find more information and resources to support you and your school team. Until next time, keep being innovative, keep being awesome, and remember, there is always opportunity to improve on the journey. Thanks for connecting.